నమో అరిహంతాడం నమో సిద్ధాడం నమో అరియాడం నమో వజాయం నమో లోయ సర్వ సాహుడం ఏసో పంచమో కారు సవ్ పాపు పణాశ్ను మంగళాడం చ సవ్యసిం పడమం హోవై మంగళం సో హలో సో బిఫోర్ వి స్టార్ట్ బిఫోర్ ఐ స్టార్ట్ ఇంట్రొడ్యూసింగ్ ఆర్ టాపిక్ అండ్ ఇంట్రొడ్యూసింగ్ అబౌట్ ది స్పీకర్ uh let me introduce our initiative ancient jainism so it's our initiative is a voluntary initiative to spread awareness on jain history heritage archaeology literature and other related aspects and for this we organize online sessions which are open to all revolving around various interesting topics that deals with different uh, aspects and the facets of jain world jain culture jain religion so to get regular updates please follow us on instagram and subscribe to our youtube channel i'll share the link for our, of our instagram channel and youtube uh, in the chat box soon so our today's session is on the banaras and the jains the pilgrim and education in the 17th century so banaras kashi varanasi and we have heard a lot about this city and banaras is known it's notable for hosting multiple educational institutes since the ancient times so the most of the scholarship uh, regarding the banaras is centered around the growth and development of the brahmanical institutes the hindu hindu uh, the hindu traditions even though communities like jain also had a very notable presence and they were also active participants in the uh, in the educational nexus of the city so today's talk uh, attempt to trace the participation of jains in the educational debates since the 17th century so our speaker will also continue her discussion up to the 20th century where she look at other aspects related to the history of jainism in banaras and i feel very glad to introduce the speaker who is also my senior and a very dear friend Uh, Aditi Jain is a PhD research scholar at the University of Texas in Austin, United States. She, she was a graduate student at the Department of Iranian Studies in the George August University of Göttingen in the Germany in 2021-22. She completed her bachelor's and master's from the Department of History Hindu College, University of Delhi. Between 2018 to 21 she was in for she was involved with MPhil from the same department. Where she, where she submitted her thesis titled the socio political study of a cosmopolitan uh, cultural zone jain spaces in kashi circa 1600 to 1700 ce she was also awarded the maulana azad national fellowship between 2018 to 20 she has presented papers based on based on her research at different platforms and also has publications pertaining to different subjects to her credit She has served as assistant professor in colleges affiliated to University of Delhi, including the Hindu College, the Hansaraj College, Garki College, etc. Welcome, Aditi. I'm so glad. We are all glad to uh, host you, and thank you for agreeing to come and give us time on the early morning of Saturday. <laughs> your, your time, no, your morning, in your time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, Anjit, for this generous introduction. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, that. there are emerging studies now on the jains in the city of banaras thereby changing the narrative and that's precisely what i'll be discussing um, now so i think uh, without further ado we should begin our talk i'll just share my screen yes, certainly thank you so much absolutely uh, i'm glad to be here So, Banaras and the Jains pilgrimage and education in the 17th century. So, this is just a brief uh, map of Banaras. Um, I mean, most of our participants would not would be familiar with the location, the geography of Banaras. Uh, but it's always good to begin with the basics. So, here, right in the heart of the ganga jamuna dawab we have the city with uh, known by its various names banaras varanasi uh, kashi and here adjacent to that is just a um, short map uh, uh, 
showing the important Jain spheres in the city of Banaras. So you have the Ganga River and you can see that on the bank of the river Ganga, we have multiple temples and shaityales spread throughout the course of the river as well as at important centers of the city. So we can just briefly keep this map in mind to uh, make our talk more informed. So firstly, as the topic says, um, the talk will be about Banaras as a Jain pilgrimage and Banaras as a Jain education center. So let's just begin um, with a brief anecdote. And this anecdote, this story comes from the 17th century, um, um, the 16th century, 17th century autobiography by the Jain merchant named Banarasi Das. And it was, in, uh, it was the autumn of the first half of the 17th century when a young Jain merchant from Jaunpur named Banarasi Das excitedly traveled to the city called Banaras. He visited the uh, holy shrines of the Jain deities, Lord Parshwanath and Lord Saparshwanath. And he writes, Kashi Nagri Megai Pratham Nahai Gang Puja Pas Supas Ki Kivi Dhari Mandrak. Uh, roughly translates through the pilgrims traveled to the city of Kashi and took a bath in the Ganges, after which they worship Parshwanath and Suparshwanath that filled their hearts with joy. Um, Banarsi Das's autobiography, Arzakatana, describes Banaras as a pilgrimage for the Jains as well as for the Hindus, while also portraying it as a commercially viable space. Through his flourishing business ventures at a time when the Mughal Empire was, it, was uh, at its full glory and the province was under the governance of Nawab Pilish Khan. And he writes, Chet Mahine Paan Leo Vite Maaz Shahzad, Ai Punyo Kaate Ki Chale Log Sab Jat, Chale Shivmati Nahan Ko Jaini Poojan Paas, Tini Ke Saath Banarasi Chale Banarasi Das. So people of all caste and creed travel together to Banaras. While the Shiva worshippers are going to take bath in the Ganges, the Jains are going to pay homage to Lord Parshwanath. Banaras Das travels to Banaras with this group of pilgrims. And with these two couplets, um, we can very well establish that as far back in time as the 17th century, Banaras had already been identified by this Jain merchant as a space that was equally sacred for both the Hindus as well as the Jains. Now, but why was this the case? Why was uh, Banaras so revered among the Jains and the Jain traditions? And why do we have its mention in the 17th century? Uh, autobiography. So uh, we see that the places that are associated with the life and birth of the Tankaras are usually considered to be extremely sacred in terms of its speciality um, of the geography as well as the city that Banaras came to be, uh, that Banaras developed into later. So the places that are associated with five auspicious events in the life of a Tirthankara, namely Chyavan Kalyanak, which is the conception, Janma Kalyanak, that is the birth, Diksha Kalyanak, that is renunciation, Kevali Gyan Kalyanak, that is omniscience, and Nirvan Kalyanak, uh, Kalyanak, that is salvation. These are highly venerated by both the Digambar and Shwetambar sects of the Jains. Now, um, Banaras was associated with the birth of the two important, actually, I would say the four important Jain Tirthankaras, Lord Shreyansanath, Lord uh, Chanda Prabhu, Lord uh, Suparshanath, and uh, Lord Parshanath. And eventually what happened was that the important sites which, which were passed down in the memory of the Jains were marked with shrines and temples to commemorate these events. And 
these sites developed into shrines and temples through a very heavy and continuous patronage by the wealthy merchants of the community and eventually leading to the formation of a pilgrimage city. Um, um, Jain texts like Rishibhashita, Acharanga, Uttardhyaya Sutra, Kalpa Sutra, Vivek Kalp, about which we'll be talking shortly, and Arth Kathanak, from which the couplets were taken, celebrate Banaras as the birth city of Lord Parshwanath, and this forms the basis of growth and development of Banaras as a holy space for the Jain community. Now, there are several sutras um, to which it's difficult to identify the exact chronology, and there are several editions um, and additions to the uh, to these uh, writings later on. But it is fairly well established, as you can see from as far back as the first century, that the birth of these Tirthankaras were associated with uh, Banaras. Now, this is quite an interesting intervention because. Uh, when the colonial narratives were written about Banaras, they were always through the lens of a Hindu city. So if you read James Princep, who is quite an authority on Banaras, and he has published uh, these um, glorious illustrations and descriptions about Banaras, you see that it's heavily dominated by an idea that it's a timeless city, it's a sacred city. It's a city which is lined with Ghats and the Ghats are lined with temples. And uh, the uh, mention of the Jain sort of creates a rupture in that particular uh, narrative. And in this context, I would also like to mention that the merchants played a very critical role in transforming Banaras as a sacred space. Um, the Jains, as we already know, are regarded highly as highly important mercantile community with commendable economic strength. They were bestowed with titles like Sate, the Sahus, the Shahs, which was accorded to the head of the merchant guilds or the merchant with a significant social standing. It indicates their power and status in commercial networks. The expenditure of Jain merchants uh, and Jain families on temples, the bazaars, and the dwelling houses made a significant contribution to urban economies in general in medieval and early modern period. It has been argued that the Jains would spend over 25 lakh of rupees on religious buildings and public facilities in Delhi alone between 1790 to 1820. The Jains in Banaras invested heavily in the construction of religious spaces, converting Banaras into a major landmark for Jain pilgrimage. And this is what I've argued uh, elsewhere, that this is a fine example wherein we see the confluence of what I like to call it as a sacred and the material. So, in other words, the uh, simply the presence of or the association of the birth of the Tirthankaras in the city of Banaras is not alone to uh, develop into a pilgrimage center. The careful designing of Banaras, as we could uh, also see in the map that I have shown you, was only possible because Banaras was a commercially viable space. It, uh, it was right at the uh, center of other uh, important mercantile spaces such as Delhi, Agra, and Patna, which is also the base where Banarasi Das operates. And it was the coming together of the material culture of Banaras that was supported and encouraged by the merchants that really brought together the commercial, um, the sacred and the material, giving birth to Banaras as a pilgrimage center. Okay, so let's see how the Jain sources are redefining Banaras. So, uh, Ardha Kathana, which was written by the Sri Mal Jain merchant Banarsi Das, corroborates this account of redef redefinition. And how does he do that? So, this text challenges the nomenclature Shiva Puri. So, we all know that Banaras is known as a Shiva Puri or the land of Shiva uh, or the city of Shiva. 
but he says that it was called the Shiva Puri because the Jain Tirthankaras revealed the Shiva path or the path of truth. And therefore, the epithet of Shiva Puri was given to Banaras. And this is a major redefinition of the city, which was now, if you call Shiva Puri to Banaras, it's always like it's a city of the Lord Shiva. But if you look at the sources in the 17th century, it's also using the same epithet and sort of re-looking or redefining its perspective. Um, and the multiplicity of these narratives that the presence uh, of the Jains, the presence of the Hindus, shows that there are multiple, multiple narratives demonstrating the flexibility of identities that are often molded according to the context and as per the requirements of different communities. So one can easily say that since uh, Arthika Thanak was being written by a Jain merchant, the narrative and the discourse on Banaras would also be in the favor of the Jains or from a Jain lens, if I can um, say it that way. Um, and in this context, I believe that education offers quite an interesting window in this multiplicity of narratives. So uh, with this, so now we have established that Banaras was a, a sacred space for the Jains. We have established that the Banar, uh, that uh, the city of Banaras was um, a hub of merchants. There were several merchants who were actively participating in the mercantile nexus. We can discuss more about that if you want in the Q&A session. And with this, now we we'll enter into the realm of education, which is uh, what the center and the core of my talk is going to be. And we'll see that through uh, this education, we not only look at the presence of several communities in the city, but we also see the dynamics between the Jains and the Hindus who were present within the uh, within a same uh, geographical space. All right. So Banaras, we know, is uh, called the Athens of the East. So I mean, you're fairly familiar with the fact that Banaras has several names. It's called the City of Learning. It's called Athens of the East. As we saw, it's also called Shiva Puri. And um, one of the reasons why it's called the Athens of the East or City of Learning is because the medieval and early modern sources are replete with information on how Banaras emerged as a center of education. So our first very descriptive uh, um, non-Indian, if we can call it that way, account about Banaras uh, comes from Francois Bernier, who was a French traveler. And he says that the town contained no colleges or regular classes, unlike the universities of the West, but resembled the schools of the ancients, where the masters were dispersed over different parts of the town in private houses and principally in the gardens of the suburbs, which the rich merchants permitted them to occupy. Now, this small paragraph actually opens a window into something very, very diverse. So firstly, Francoia Bernier is saying that education was something that was commonplace in Banaras, which means that it was present, it was imparted in several households, it was imparted um, in several nooks and corners of the city. And while it was not uh, resembling the university or the college set, set up that the West already boasted of in the 16th century, it still had a, uh, a what we uh, generally all understand as the Gurukul system. So there was a master and there were several students. And he says that a master would usually take no more than five to seven students and would really cultivate them, nurture them. The students would stay with the teacher. And all of this was happening at the merchant house, uh, merchant households, which means that the merchants were not only, uh, you know, participating and increasing the 
contributing to the sacredness of the city through developing temples, but they had an equal contribution to the making of Banaras as an educational center. And here we are not just talking about the Jain merchants, but we are also talking about merchants in general. And uh, this is actually not very different from the modern times where we see that uh, rich households or the merchant households contribute profusely to the cause of education in general. Uh, to carry on a little um, uh, more explicitly and, and, and elaborately about Bernier, we see that he was writing in the 17th century about Banaras and calls it the celebrated seat of learning, which was situated on the banks of Ganga in the beautiful location and in the, um, uh, and in the middle of an extremely fine and rich country. He argues that it may be considered a general school of the Gentiles, which can be translated as Brahmins, and therefore he calls it the Athens of India or Athens of the East. Um, and as we've already discussed that um, he was really struck by the kind of learning that was imparted in uh, Banaras. Um, it, from Bernier's account, it is pretty clear that the um, Gentiles or the Brahmins had an important role to play in this educational nexus. Uh, the pundits played an important role in social, in religious and cultural life in the city. They upheld Sanskrit learning by studying scriptures, training students, participating in shastras. Now, shastras are debates on scriptures and by writing and copying the manuscripts. Further, they also issued verdicts on social religious issues and delivered sermons on scriptural and ritual conduct. So they were really upholding the ideas of education and shaping and molding them, uh, which was thoroughly based on Sanskrit learning, debates about Sanskrit scriptures, and it was also very sec sacred but limited domain in which a certain section of uh, population was uh, invited, while others were excluded. Uh, the Mughal chronicles also refer to Banaras as a hub of knowledge, and Jahangir in his memoir talks about a learned Brahmin who was very well versed in the rational and traditional sciences that he said that he uh, was taught and he grasped in uh, Banaras. And now Kashi as an integral city of uh, learning finds repeated references in various Jain literature. So uh, the 14th century Vivid Tirthkal gives a list of disciplines as a part of learning in the city, which is a crucial detail that can be added to the idea of Bernier that it was a center for learning. And in his description, while it, it was a domain of the Gentiles, we see that its uh, mention in the Vivid Teeth Gulf would also supplement to this understanding that the Jains were also aware and were interested in participating in this educational nexus. Um, and um, just to, yeah. Uh, just to elaborate a little bit more on that, we see that the subjects that Jin Prabhasuri mentions included metallurgy or dhatuvad, alchemy, alchemy or rasvad, logic or tark, grammar or shabdanushasan, drama literature, na natakalankar, astrology, jyotish, literature, sahitya, and semantics, nemit shastra. So back in the 14th century, there was already a clear cut understanding of the various divisions and levels of disciplines that were not only present, but were taught in Banaras and were very well known in the city. Um, it has been found out that, um, okay, uh, before I proceed, so Yashobhajai, uh, sorry, Jain Prabhasuri, who was, who was the author of uh, Vivid Teeth Kalp, also says that scholars from all four directions visited the city and many learned men adorned Banaras with their presence. Uh, 
when can see that the educational identity of minaris was recognized across spaces and religious groups and that was perhaps due to the diversity of the subjects that were taught by renowned masters who were well known for their academic and philosophical prowess and this was not just true for the 14th century but also in the 18th and the 19th century it has been found out that there were almost 76 parchalas 62 of which were situated close to the ganga ghat where majority of the pandits resided the subjects that held reference even in the modern era included vedas uttar mimamsa nyaya jyotish vyakaran kavya shastra puran ayurveda etc and one can easily map these two that uh, the modern disciplines that are taught and the, the ones that were mentioned in the 14th century have a lot of parallels between the two now uh, while talking about banaras and while talking about education we've already established that it was well noted for its disciplining uh, in the 14th century and in the 17th century there was a very prominent figure with the name yasho vijayagari who was a shwetambar jain jain monk uh, belonging to the lineage initiated by hira vijay suri the famous shwetambar monk who had close relations with the mughal emperor akbar and he came to banaras as we will see through his story not only uh, learned a lot from the brahmins but also participated in actively in the debates thereafter earning him a lot of respect a lot of praise and his participation really uh, cemented the educational nexus in uh, banaras the jain educational uh, nexus in uh, banaras so to better understand the jain education uh, one must turn to the life of yashoda uh, vijay gani he was born sometime before uh, 1629 common era in gujarat and passed away in 1694 with his last chamasa in surat uh now the important sources for the reconstruction of yashoda vijay gani's life are his own writings and uh, suja saveli which is a contemporary writing by a contemporary monk by with the name uh, muni kanti kanti vijayati and this is quite interesting because usually you do not see contemporary monks writing biographies or uh, descriptions about Uh, their fellow uh, saints now the story of yasho vijay's advent towards banaras begins in uh, circa 1642 where he along with his teacher nyaya vijay went to ahmedabad in gujarat to join a gathering of monks here he impressed a present audience with his command over jain philosophy and excellent memory Uh, Dhanaji Sura, who was a Srishti, a high was highly charmed by the monk, and requested Yashu Vijay to travel to Kashi, that was known for teachings in six types of philosophies in the 17th century. Now we've already discussed the details on the types of philosophies that were taught. The merchant provided Yashu Vijay Gandhi with a hundi worth two hundred two thousand silver coins for his educational pursuits. and therefore we get this verse from suja saveli uh, written by munni kanti vijay uh, it says dhanaji sura sha vachan guru naam suni ho lal ani man dina rajat na kharchyo ho lal so the merchant dhanaji sura is giving away or say, uh, monetary requirements to yashoda vijay gadi to fulfill his educational uh, purposes uh now we come to the uh entire nexus entire context in which yashu vijay gani was operating it is believed that around 1626 ad yashu vijay gani came to banaras where he studied the uh, the navya nyaya shastra from the famous nayaka ragudeva nyan uh, nayankar sorry uh, nyaya lankar 
The city of Kashi, located between northern and southern networks, attracted a new wave of intellectual specialists. And in this wave of immigrant scholars, the Jains were not the only participants. There were uh, Maratha Brahmins constituting quite an integral part of this movement. Uh, we have the Chaturdhara or the Chaudhary family who came from the south and settled themselves in Banaras. Um, uh, we have several names, um, several important names from uh, uh, the southern region, both central India and Maharashtra, coming to Banaras and participating in this very important uh, developing and growing philosophy of Navya Shastra, about which Rosa Kino Handlin has also discussed in quite detail. And this, um, and the city of um, Banaras in the 17th century was emerging as an intellectual space that saw a heavy influx of scholars. Many of them became permanent residents of the city. And Nyai was at this moment in Kashi quite a prominent discipline for which everyone was coming. Now, what exactly is Nyai? And if we uh, just look at one part of the word, Navya Nyaya Shastra, so we just look at Nyaya, it means logic, about which Abul Fazl in his third volume of Ayne Akbari had already described what exactly was this word and this discipline. And he says that the nine schools of learning and Nyaya uh, was one among these nine schools. According to Fazl, the founder of the school of Nyaya was the sage Gautama. It encompassed several disciplines. Uh, so Nyai included several disciplines, that is physiology, theology, mathematics, logic, and dialectics. And there is a lot of philosophical discussion on what exactly Nyai means. But uh, in, in uh, brief, it means that the followers held the supreme being to be exempt from plurality, incorporeal, and free from all defect. So it really promoted a oneness with the supreme being wherein you are leaving your body aside and really concentrating on the uh, soul um so before we proceed i would just like to talk a little bit more about um the nyai as a philosophy so abul fazl is writing that the practitioners maintain that god is the absolute efficient cause and that the works of men are produced by these two sources of causation the moral distinctions of good and evil in action are deduced from the divine books they believe in heaven and hell the former is called the nark hell as we even today call uh, call it nark which was located in the lower region and the later the latter is called swarga and is assigned to the celestial region they do not believe in a perpetual duration of existence in the in either paradise or hell and human beings thus will come and go until they have fully received the recompense or punishment of their former deeds, after which, freed from the necessity of these two states, they will be liberated from joy and sorrow. Um, so according to Rosalino Handel, the Easterners had their strong base in the discipline of logic, which was pursued actively in the scholar communities of Mithila and Navadvipa. Whereas the Southern scholars were best known for their participation in grammar, hermeneutics, and dharmashastras. Um, considering the disciplines that were taught in the city, it can be inferred from the 16th century that Banaras was the center of the studies in Nyaya. Uh, the, the innovation to the concept of Nyaya came about in the 17th century, which was a period of extensive intellectual change both within and outside the Mughal court. And, historiography, uh, and historiographically, this period has received much attention in both political and cultural terms. So besides reconstructing the details of the reigns of Mughal emperors, historians have also talked about several other developments that characterized early modernity. Um, so for those who are aware, um, um, I'll just reiterate, uh, 
16th and 17th centuries it is characterized as an era of early modernity which saw a lot of interaction between and across geographical spaces in this case being the Mughal, Ottomans and the Safavids and the influx of scholars happening as a result of this interaction really created a new intellectual uh, domain. Um, so Sheldon Pollock has argued that the proponents of the traditional trivium of knowledge of words, sentences, and reasons label the immigrant scholars as navya or new. Um, so uh, the term in fact symbolizes a different way of thinking, along with signifying a change in the relationship with the past. Quite similar to Pollock's argument, we also have Rajiv Kindra, who was talking about uh, early mo modern Indo-Persian poets who reinvigorated the classical literary tradition by calling it fresh or taza gui. Uh, and this is where um, I come to my point that uh, Yasho Vijay Gani belonged to this school of scholars associated with a new philosophical analysis or Navya Nyaya. So Nyaya was already there, but the new philosophical angle to it was the Navya Nyaya. So Nyaya was actually very well known to the Jains and Acharya Siddhi Sen is credited with Nyaya Vatra and Sanmati Tarka which is known as a first word of law, uh, the first work of logic. And from here, the Jain's understanding of Nyaya developed further and was given a new direction in the 8th century with the work of Akalanka, who was not only, uh, who not only established Smriti, Pratyubhujna, or recognition in Tarka rationality as independent Pramana, but also redefined the meanings of, excuse me, perception, inference, and agama, as given by Siddha Sen and Acharya Samantabhadra from the 5th century. So without um, uh, going further into the modalities of Navya Nyaya, we I'll just directly come uh, to what was Yasho Vijay Gani's uh, participation in this. Um, he became one of the first Jain scholars to study this newly emerging branch of knowledge. His most well-known contribution towards this philosophy is through his works, Tarka Bhasha and Nyay Bindu, and uh, Jonathan Ganeri, who has worked on Yasho Vijay's life. Uh, he says that his life can actually be divided into three phases. Um, first, he came as an apprentice in Banaras. The second phase was where he wrote extensively on Jain phil philosophical treatises. And finally, he wrote texts with greater emphasis on spiritual and religious realm. He is known to have earned the epithet Nyaya Visharad or one who is skilled in logic and Tarkik Shiromani or the head of logic. It is widely believed that after emerging victorious in a debate encounter with Kashmiri Brahman, who was well known for his knowledge, Yashovijay Gani came to be treated with great respect by Brahmins of Banaras. So uh, this actually, and this last statement actually feeds into this entire idea that Brahmins were really the gatekeepers of knowledge in Banaras um, in medieval and early modern times, and that they would especially not be welcoming to the Shramana believers or the Shravakas who were who wanted to study and who wanted to be a part of this uh, important. Uh, disciplines that were taught in Banaras and there are multiple stories within the Jain narratives, within the Jain writings, right from the uh, writings of Acharya Samantabhadra that uh, the Jains were categorically excluded from this uh, nexus and more than often uh, the Jains had to disguise themselves as Brahmin to be a welcome to be able to participate in this um, educational uh, realm created and uh, were conducted by the Brahmins. And Yasho Vijay Gani's story is also something very similar. So it's believed that he, along with his teacher, disguised themselves as Brahmins so that 
the Brahmins would really uh, allow them to learn this Navya Nyaya. And uh, it was only when Yashavaja Gari established his authority on, on these disciplines, when he, with, because of his continuous participation in the debates um, with the Maratha Brahmins and the Banaras Brahmins and Maratha Brahmins also had a, a bit of uh, intellectual tussle going on between among themselves about which Rosalino Handen has written for those who want to uh, study mm -hmm. further. So um, among all of this, um, and, and these are some ideas yeah, which are very well uh, sort of uh, created and carried on even now. So, um, so I actually uh, thought that probably the talk will uh, talk till here will take a lot of time. So in case we have more time, maybe I'll, I can also talk a little bit about the 19th and 20th century. Yes, sir. yes, yes, you can certainly talk about that. Okay, all right, uh, good enough, good enough. So, um, so at present, uh, we have several Jain institutions which are of very, which are very, very well respected in the city. Um, so we have the Syadwad Mahavidyale, uh, as you can see, it's on, it's located on the Jain Ghat. In Banaras, we also have Parshwanath Vidya Beat. We um, and it's believed that ever since Yesho Vijay Gari, we there has been a spur in the development of Jain educational centers in Banaras, and um, that has really up, uh, you know uh, made Banaras a very prominent space for Jain for Jains and education in uh, general. So um, we, while we do not really know uh, with complete authority, but it's believed that um, the, there were a number of schools that developed in Banaras, especially near the Ram Ghat, which is at present an important Shwetambar center. With its uh, multiple Ramka temples over there, uh, it's believed that Yashavaja Gani actually established a part shala. And uh, this can be further corroborated by the autobiography of uh, the founder of Syadbad Mahavidyale, the picture that I'm showing you right now. It was founded in 1904 by Shilla Ganesh Prasad Barani. And uh, the establishment of this Jain Educational Institute significantly transformed and broadened the scope and horizons of Jain learning in Kashi. So his autobiography titled Meri Jeevan Gatha has, uh, has enough and enormous details about this institute, which is present near uh, or at the uh, Jain Ghat. While there is no detail about the previous Yashovijay Garni's Parshala, it is quite clear that it might have been at Ram Ghat, as I've uh, shown you, uh, oh sorry, told you before, which was the area where Shwetambar Jain temples are present today. Varaniji writes that uh, as he walked through the streets near the Panchayati uh, temple, which is another important temple in Banaras, he came across a Shwetambar Vidyale, which was managed by Sri Dharma Vijay Suri. The subjects taught here included logic, scriptural, scriptural studies, literature, and so on. And the famous professor who talked who taught logic here was Ambadasji Shastri. Um, this anecdote is crucial for furthering the argument that the Jain educational involvement in the city was continuing from the 17th century up till the 20th century. Uh, uh, however, uh, being a Digambar Jain, Varaniji rejected the kind offer made by Shri Dharma Vijay Suri to study logic at the Parshala. And therefore, we know that the sectarian division between the Digambars and Shwetambars increased with modernity. Um, and after some time, Varaniji conceived and executed his idea to establish a Degambar Jain Institute in the city, which he considered as an abode of Sanskrit learning. Uh, the beginning of Syadwad Mahavidal is actually quite interesting. And uh, it's believed that Varaniji first 
went to a Brahmin's household who uh, rejected his quest for education. And after that, he decided that he would uh, establish the institution at his own um, strength and command. And um, in the large city of Varanasi, where thousands of students are studying Sanskrit and enlightening themselves, he writes, we the Jain students are denied education. The place where hundreds of places fulfill the basic necessities of the students that is learning Sanskrit, there are hardly any provisions for even five Jain students. The grandeur of Yasho Vijay Vidyale, he writes, is alluring where 20 monks and 10 students were learning and discussing the Shwetambara Jain literature, all due to the efforts of Dharma Vijay Suri. Can our Degamba community not provide for 10 to 20 students? I am writing in the hope. So he was writing to 64 merchants across the Indian subcontinents. And he's saying that I'm writing to you in the hope that you would accept my humble request, which is not my request alone, but that of the entire Jain student community. If institutes, namely Mahavidyalay Mathura, Mahaparachala Jaipur, and Sait Mewarji, uh, Khurja Vidyale can flourish. Kashi is the appropriate place to learn Sanskrit and there is no place like this. Hope you pay kind attention to our request. So this is a translation from an excerpt from his autobiography, um, which is um, available. Uh, I mean, I got my copy from uh, Banaras itself and it is quite an interesting insight, not just into the 20th century Banaras, but also the modalities with which an educational institution was established and was uh, flourished. And as soon as Varaniji wrote this letter, funds started pouring in, in, pouring in for the institute from various court quarters. The merchants became crucial supporters once again in this regard through their monetary contribution. Um, and we've already seen that ever since Bernier had written about the education in Banaras, we see that merchants were active participants in this. Uh, even in the case of Yasha Vijay Garni, we had Dhanaji Sura, who had uh, really funded his education. And um, there has thus been a very important and close correlation between the merchants and educational institutes as the former became an indispensable part of the process through their monetary involvement. Um, a few names of the primary contributors to Syadwad Mahavidyale uh, were people like Sait Manik Chand from Bombay, Devakumar Jain from Ara, Lal Moti Lal from Delhi, and so on and so forth. Uh, the Syadwad Mahavidyalaya was inaugurated in 1905 on the space given by Dev Kumar Rais of Ara, that's in the present day uh, state of Bihar, which is the same where stood the Bhardaini Digambar Jain Temple. The institutes came into existence with the cooperation and collaboration of three individuals, namely Shilla Ganesh Prasad Varini, Baba Bhagirath Varini, and Pandit Pannalal Vakliwal. The case of Syadwad Mahavidyalaya is extraordinary because it was a major step towards institutionalization of education in the heartland of the Indo-Gangetic Basin. There were several other schools, as has been mentioned in detail in the postcard by Varaniji, but none of them garnered fame and reputation with time as this one. And um, it, uh, 20th century was really the time when a lot of institutions were growing in modern India with the coming of uh, institutionalization and modernization brought forth by the, uh, because of colonialism. And um, Sadhvat Mahavidyalaya's establishment should also be looked within this context itself. Um, so historians, including uh, uh, the very famous Vasudha Dalmia, have also talked about the growth of uh, Hindi nationalism in Banaras. And we see that parallel developments were taking place within Jain community who were also receiving aids from Maratha merchants. Um, and with these funds, they came up with a proper designated educational setup. There was an attempt at consolidating and homogenizing Jain education, with which, which would also derive its form and pedagogy from the Brahmanical training. 
and uh, the idea is sustained and flourished even after Syadbad Mahavidyale. So we have Parshunath Vidyapeet coming in 1938 with the efforts of Pandit uh, Soklalji Sangvi um, and others. And it is, uh, at present, it houses one of the richest collection of Jain literature in North India. And with this, I come to my conclusion. And uh, so, as you can see that I've traced the age-old understanding that Banaras was a city of education and learning, but raises, but have raised, or tried to raise questions on Brahmanical side of it. Uh, I've traced the evidence um, about uh, Jain, educa uh, Jain education and its presence in Banaras from the 14th century onwards, right up to the 20th century and uh, the community's participation in the intellectual fervor of the city. An attempt is made to look into how the city and its social and cultural aspects are not defined by a single community alone, but had multiple communities present within the same geographical space. Um, the, there is an active Jain participation in pilgrimage, economic, and educational nexus in Banaras. The tropes of Jain Brahmanical cooperation and contrast continued through the 14th up till the 20th century, and it continued to garner a space within the secret city. Everyone wanted to participate, everyone wanted to become a part of, to contribute towards the learning, towards the sacrality of the city of Banaras. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditi, for this interesting lecture. And it's certainly it's very enlightening uh, the way you have weaved the development of uh, Banaras as a gen center in 16th, 17th century from the aspect of trade and the from the intelli intellectual aspect and the way yeah. it can be linked up to the 19th, 20th century. It's certainly very interesting. And Thank we have you. many questions with us and with live with the limited time frame, we'll try to get on most of them. So yeah. first question is like one of my, is my personal question. Uh, yeah. What is the major, uh, say the, the historical source for knowing about the life of Yasho Vijay Gadi? Now mm -hmm. I have asked this question particularly because, so he's one of the major Jain intellectual figure who has participated in the Shastra of Kashi. And if we look from more of a uh, Brahmanical Hindu perspective, when we look at the hagiographies of Vallabhacharya, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and Ad from Adi Shankaracharya, 16th century, 17th century, Absolutely. up to the uh, 19th century Swaminarayan text. So they all spoke, they all spoke of a common tradition of the involvement of these religious leaders in the Shastra of Kashi. Yeah. And one yeah. particular aspect common to all of them is that they have defeated a rival sect, which may be any of them. Most of the time, it's either Advait or say in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's or in uh, Swaminan writings. So how do we look at the account of Yasho Vijay Gani's presence and Shastra in the Jain hagiographies? Okay. So, uh... Okay, so Yashu Vijay Gani's contribution has been very well noted in a very specific domain, which is the Nyaya Shastra. So uh, we have Nyaya Bindu as his important work. We have, I think, Tarika Shastra um, as his other important work. And as I've mentioned, as Suja Saveli, uh, who's, which, you know, I can just type the name which was by Mani Kranti Vijay. And this really gives a very holistic kind of a, uh, analysis of Suja Saveli, uh, of uh, Yashu Vijay Gani, not only his intellectual contribution, but also um, his, um, the way he really developed his ideas and the difficulties that he uh, faced in just, you know, garnering that education. So he has been a very well-respected figure, either in the Jain hagiographies or uh, even in some of the other non-Jain sources. Uh, the best, the best place you can really talk about Yashavijay Gani is not just the Sanskrit sources but also Gujarati sources. Uh, so uh, a lot has been written about the monk um, in um, in Gujarati and. Uh, 
um, that really has contributed to the entire building up of the image of uh, Yashobhi Jai Gani. Um, but a lot needs to be done because up till now, it's only, uh, I think, Janardhan Ganeri's article, which is uh, there, uh, very well studied, which really talks about what he was doing, where he was coming to, and the, the philosophy of Navya Nyaya. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very fascinating that uh, Jains are very much part of the broader intellectual nexus. Mm -hmm. It's not just about Nyaya. But they are also participating with the newer schools within the NIA to, yeah. to be part of the broader uh, scholastic nexus. So, uh, what is the time period of this uh, text you mentioned? So, just really, uh, the roughly the century. Oh, it's 17, it's 17th century. So very close to his life. Very close to, yes, very close to his time. And uh, you also have texts written in the 18th century. Okay. So, uh, yeah, there has been a lot of uh, overlaps. Okay. So, uh, there is one question. Could you please type down the name of the center that you uh, that you mentioned Yeshovija founded in Banaras? Oh, um, it's just um, it's just the name of the center is not really there. It's just called a Yeshovija which is not exist like not there anymore. But we only know about its existence because there are some records on which which states that there were uh, there was a Patshala in uh, in the Ramghat area, and his mention has been uh, there uh, in uh, Shulak Ganesh Prasad Barniji's autobiography. So that's how we really know that he either he established a Patshala or a Patshala was established in his name. I, uh, we do not really know because the uh, Pachala is not ex um, there any longer. So, Dharam Vijay Gani's uh, Pachala was also in the Ramghat? Yeah, that is the one which was on the Ramghat. Uh, the Sadhbad Mahavidyal is on the Jain Ghat. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, there are two uh, in questions of uh, Swami yeah. Sassinaji. So, first is, can you please uh, be able to explain the Jain scholastic relationship with the Mughal emperors or the Mughal empire in general? And she's interested in knowing how the religion coexisted during this time. Uh, if it's a long answer, please feel free to refer some papers which she can read. And she mm -hmm. has also asked... Uh, um, So it's it's about the whether the nyaya is still being taught in the Jain gurukuls of the uh, Banaras. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Saxena, for uh, for your questions. Um, so the Jain and the Mughals are very very closely related, and um, a lot of scholars, including my uh, MPhil supervisor, Professor Shalin Jain, has written extensively on the Jain-Mughal relations. In particular, his book is titled uh, The Jains Under the Mughals, which really in much detail talk about how the Jain monks were participating in, within the Mughal court. They were receiving patronage. They were participating in the um, very rich intellectual debate happening at the court of Akbar, even Jahangir, and even later on Shah Jahan. Um, and because the uh, Jain merchants were so closely related to the monks, and every state, not just the Mughal state, really um, have a high dependency on the merchants. Um, so it was very important for the state to uh, to be in constant contact with the monks, to be uh, supportive of uh, Jain monks, and to respect them very, uh, you know, deeply and uh, properly. And um, that really influenced on the equation which the Mughals would then have with the Jain merchants. So uh, for the state, for the Mughal state, of course, with Akbar, we see a lot of religious changes happening um, the space was becoming quite uh, cosmopolitan and within that the Jain monks had a had a very very active participation both for philosophical and for economic purposes 
Um, I must say, however, that most of the records that we have with us right now, uh, with that is the Jain Mughal relations, mostly come from the Shwetambar records or the Shwetambar sect. Um, and there is quite uh, an important presence of the Shwetambar Jain monks, including, as I mentioned, Hira Vijay Suri, uh, in the court of these Mughal kings. Um, so, yeah, you can definitely refer to Professor Shalin Jain's book, Jain Under the Mughals, for uh, further details on this. Um, and the second question is about whether Nyai is being taught today or not. I would say that probably uh, Nyai as a discipline would not be taken up as uh, exclusively as it would have been in the 17th century, but it's very much a part of the Jain the uh, theology and Jain philosophy itself. So it's really, you know, taught as the uh, holistic uh, idea. Pretty I fine hope answer. that answers the question. It's a pretty fine answer. Uh, so there's one question. Do you know of any current places in Banaras that are still directly connected with Yeshu Vijay? Um, I mean, um, it's only the Ramghat area which has a few Shwetambar Jain temples where you really see, um, uh, uh, as the poster has also shown, um, an image of Yeshua Vijay Gandhi, like a statue of Yeshua Vijay Gandhi, which is actually, um, I mean, not from Banaras. But um, the, there are very surprisingly no such extent places which also probably proves that he really did not establish the Parachala himself, but probably it was established by one of his disciples or something. So what happened was that uh, right after he participated in the um, in the debates in the Shastra Arts and was given the epithet of Nyai Visharad, he moved to Banaras and uh, he moved from Banaras, went to Agra, went to Delhi and eventually went back to uh, Gujarat. Uh, which is probably why his contribution to establishing institutions was not really high. And even his nexus of disciples is uh, mostly present in Gujarat and not uh, Banaras. So um, we do not have, except for sources mentioning about him coming to Banaras, we really do not have any institutional presence uh, in the present day city. Okay. So, thank you. And we have one more interesting question, uh, which I got on the, in the chat. It's on, it's on the Jain, the representation of the Jain in the Hindu literature, uh, precisely for the Kashi. And if there okay. is lack of such references, say, because uh, there's a mention that we have this Kabir, Tulsidas, and so many hegeographical mm -hmm. uh, Sanskrit yeah. literature which speaks out, which describes the intellectual landscape of Kashi. So, mm -hmm. if there is an absence of uh, the present absence of the mention of Jains, how do you understand it? Okay, so uh, there is no denying the fact that the Jains have been excluded from most of the writings, uh, especially by what we today understand as the Hindu writings, um, and the reason is very simplistic um, that the Jains, as you know, incorporated to Hinduism as we as a community we have been today was not really the case back in the medieval and early modern era. This is not to say that there was no close cooperation or interaction. There was, so there certainly was, but the distinction in identities was also quite sharp and profound. So we do, there was fluidity, people were uh, converting, etc, etc. However, um, Simply because the labeling of the Jains as Shramana, as someone who did not believe in the Brahmanical caste system and also the lineage of worship, their presence was categorically excluded from most of the writings. In fact, if you go on a field trip to Manaras today, um, it is quite a uh, common and an important trope that um, a lot of the Jain centers, including temples, were destroyed with the coming of Shankaracharya. Now, uh, we do not have really uh, existing records on how far is this idea true, 
or uh, to what extent uh, or in what manner did the Jains really retaliate it. But what we do know for sure is that the idea of an exclusive Brahmin presence in Banaras was very well maintained. And that is also very uh, sharply and profoundly visible in the colonial narratives, which also were written as a result of the Brahmins. Uh, you know, the Brahmins were hired to be associates to the colonial uh, writers. And the fact that the colonial narrative very explicitly mentions only about the uh, Brahmins and the presence of the Pandits within the uh, sacred and the educational networks actually speaks about the exclusion of Jains. Um, it has come down to us. So I think in that case, uh, your own study is very notable in introducing and intervening <laughs> the histories of Jainism in the broader, you know, the broader understanding, yeah. broader discourse of Kashi. Thank you so yeah. much, Aditi, for coming and giving your, you know, you. your time as well um, as the information. Yeah, I see that in the chat box. Uh, it's been rightly pointed out that Parshwanath Vidya Beat is, in, um, is, is really a very, very important place for anyone who's researching on Jains. Not only has it, it has a rich library, but has an amazing collection of manuscripts. And uh, they also have, I mean, residential facilities for researchers, et cetera. So yeah, people interested in Jain studies should definitely visit it. That's great. Uh, El, uh, Elva, she, ha uh, she has raised her hand. If you want, you can directly uh, unmute yourself and ask question. Or if okay. you want to introduce, have some comments or give some comments. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this talk was amazing. So, thank you so thank much. You. So I'm a PhD student in religious studies and I'm focusing on Yashu Vijaya. Actually, I am translating one of his texts from Sanskrit right now. Well, it's been, okay. it's been a while. So I'm very, very interested on your research and I was wondering if you have this, uh, what you have presented today, if you have it in a, an article or if, if I can contact you through an email for a further conversation. Oh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can just type out my email address for any further questions. There you go. Okay, so yeah, because uh, I love to be in touch if you if you don't mind, yeah. because as I'm saying, I've been yeah. working with his text for a while and uh, I'm super interested in your research. I know I'm really interested to know what uh, I mean. I mean more about Yashu Vijay Gadi. Um, so yeah, you can definitely write to me an email. Thank you. Okay, I will write you. I'm definitely like like my uh, advisors and the professors that I talk to whenever I tell them about Yashu Vijaya. They always, they often tell me, please, yeah, let's continue doing more research on this figure yeah, because he's such, a key, he's such a key figure and there's still a lack of research and most of his work has not been translated. Mm -hmm. And as you said, there is a lot in Gujarati, then yeah. he has in Sanskrit. I, I work mainly with Sanskrit and then mm -hmm. there are also some materials in Hindi. So there is mm -hmm. so much that has not been explored mm -hmm. yet. Absolutely, yes. There's uh, quite a large uh, corpus of literature which still uh, needs to be explored, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Jains. So, yeah, I would love to talk about it. Aditi, if you allow, there are one or, uh, yeah, one or yeah, two questions. Absolutely. Yeah, so, yes. uh, Abhishek ji has a question. You can directly unmute yourself and ask a question. You can ask your question directly. Abhishek ji, one of the initiatives which we have taken up. Hello. Yes, Abhishek ji, you can ask your question. I have to ask you to ask you to ask me. My question is that the Kasi's history is also seen in the Sarmana Parampara. So, I have given a lecture, I have given a target of the whole tradition. 
और उस उसके लिटरेचर रिव्यू को और जो सारे रेफरेंस मिलते हैं मेरा बेसिक क्वेश्चन ये था कि क्या शैविज्म के पहले यहाँ पे कोई परंपरा थी जो एग्जिस्ट कर रही थी जैसे मतलब जो हमारा जो वैदिक ब्राह्मण ट्रेडिशन है वो तो कहता है कि शिव के त्रिशूल पर टिका हुआ बनारस लेकिन जो इनका अध्ययन है उससे क्या ज्ञात होता है कि क्या जब बुद्ध महावीर के पहले पार्श्वनाथ के पहले भी यहाँ पे श्रवण परंपरा थी और थी तो क्या ओके, सो हमारी अंडरस्टैंडिंग में हम लोग क्या करते हैं जब खास तौर से इतिहास को पढ़ते हैं कि एंड इट्स वेरी कॉमन आई मीन देर नथिंग रॉन्ग विद इट कि बहुत सारी माइथोलॉजीज को भी हम हिस्ट्री मान लेते हैं जैसे आप बनारस का अगर आप स्कंद पुराण का काशी खंड पढ़ेंगे तो उसमें एक बहुत अलग पिक्चर आपको काशी की मिलेगी और काशी खंड भी अपने आप में एक बहुत बार एडिट किया हुआ बहुत बार उसमें एडिशन किए गए हैं उस पर्टिकुलर वर्ड्स में तो अगर हम लोग वक्त के हिसाब से देखें तो शैविज्म कब आया था या हम शैविज्म किसको कह सकते हैं ये भी अपने आप में एक बहुत बड़ा सवाल हो जाता है अगर हम हिस्टोरिकल पर्सपेक्टिव से देखें तो बट हम लोग यहाँ पे एज हिस्टोरियंस ये कोशिश करते हैं कि जो राइटिंग्स हमारे पास आई हैं उन राइटिंग्स में एक स्पेस की या एक कम्युनिटी की मेरे केस में स्पेस और कम्युनिटी की मैं जो बात कर रही हूँ उसके बारे में कैसे लिखा गया है तो हमें सबसे पहला रिकॉर्ड पार्श्वनाथ के बर्थ का मिलता है फर्स्ट सेंचुरी बिफोर कॉमन एरा में तो उससे हमें ये स्टैब्लिश हो जाता है कि जैन राइटिंग्स जो फर्स्ट सेंचुरी बीसीई में हो रही थी या जो मैन्यूस्क्रिप्ट आ रही हैं उस समय से वो कहीं ना कहीं वहां से वो आइडिया शुरू हुआ है और अब अब ये आइडिया बिल्कुल फॉर्मली स्टैब्लिश हो चुका है ऑन अ वेरी ऑनेस्ट नॉट वी डू नॉट नो एंड वी डू नॉट हैव एनी बेसिस टू नो इवन आर्कियोलॉजिकली वेदर द तीर्थंकर वॉज बॉर्न और नॉट बट इट इज थ्रू द रिटर्न ट्रेडिशन इट हैज बीन पास ऑन टू अर्स एंड वी ट्रीट द रिटर्न ट्रेडिशन एज एन एज एन अथॉरिटेटिव सोर्स इन दम सेल्व which is true for the shaivism tradition as well now the question is when did really shaivism uh, shaiva tradition came into being what text are you referring to when you're talking about shaivism if you're referring to the kashi khand then we must say that it has already been edited and it has already been um, you know molded in various ways with time so um, yeah what what i'm trying to say is that it's difficult to establish what came before which tradition but there were communities residing in banaras we know that for sure we also know that banaras was being identified as a sacred space not just by the brahmans the shaivas but also by the jains so much that there is one last question like the case of yes. yashavijagani do we have more instances where The Jains have re- have got their intellectual training under Brahmins. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, even when um, if you look at um, Banarsi Das's autobiography, he really talks about his educational pursuits. So initially, he has been. um his family doesn't really encourage him to get into philosophy and education because they feel that he is a merchant and he should learn about mercantile accounting mathematics etc but the little um uh, education that he really garners for himself is it is through the jain monks who itinerant jain monks who come who come to banaras but also under the brahmans who um, and um there was this idea that the brahmins were the upholders of education and if you wanted to get a good learning get uh, get become a master of a certain subject or a discipline you have to be a student of a particular uh, brahmin so i mean i would not deny that Uh, banaras was a space where the monks were also becoming imparters of education but the brahmin supremacy or the control of education in this regard did continue um, till uh, late in the in the 20th century
Yes, certainly interested. I can recall one uh, one thing I read in Professor Shalin's book. Mm -hmm. So there's a reference of the patronage of the of the princely state of sorry of the ruler of Jaisalmer to a Jain yeah. state where many non-Jains were also studying. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so uh, we also have instances of patronage coming to Banaras from Gujarat, not just for the establishment of the temples, but also, I mean, in the case of uh, uh, Ganesh Prasad Varniji's institute, uh, even today, I mean, anyone can really take, uh, can can really get admitted to Syadwad Mahavidyalaya, whether you are a Jain or not, you just have to be interested in the Jain philosophy. So, yeah. So I think with this note, we can conclude our discussion. Thank you so much thank you. for this wonderful lecture. And thank, thank you so you. much to all, uh, to everyone for joining and for this such an interactive session. Please follow our page on Instagram. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for getting more updates of the upcoming lectures. And again, thank you so much, Aditi, for taking out time. Thank and you. Thank you, Anshik. No, it, it was wonderful. It was wonderful presenting here and getting such insightful questions. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. With Bye. this, I'll end my uh, I'll end yeah. it. Uh, wish, I wish everyone good night. And thank you, Aditi. Thank we'll you. Be in touch. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Bye. Okay. Thank you, everyone.